What is up guys, Wrestling Premiere is here. Uh, second try actually works, and I gotta mention, like very, very rarely have we seen movie sequels work, let alone sequels to wrestling matches and feuds. This one checked off all the boxes. It was a great way of wrapping up Goldberg's career and giving him a performance that he can be proud of. And of course, this was before Saudi money came his way. I remember at the time, a bunch were pretty happy to see him. Of course, they were pissed that he hoisted the title, but compared to today, yeah, they liked him way, way more than they do now. This feud was so easy to enjoy my eyes, you know, just big guys wanting to kill each other. That's all. Brock wanted to right the biggest wrong in his eyes of his career. And yeah, it just, it wasn't trying to be something else. Brock had something irritating him for 12 years. That was the loss to Bill Goldberg. I, I like this feud. I enjoyed it at the time. I enjoyed making this video. So yeah. Now, how did this thing start? Simple. 2K. Over the past number of years, 2K Sports had a hand in bringing back a bunch of legends. The Ultimate Warrior in particular, like that one was crazy, honestly. The guy had been talking trash about WWE, Vince McMahon, Triple H for like 16 years, and all of a sudden he's under contract. Hell, this tradition goes back to 2011, THQ by the way, when Brock Lesnar, who was in the UFC at the time, was a bonus character in WWE 12. I mean, I'm just thinking about the memory of him popping up in Universe Mode, oh man, he was cool. There's other examples including Sting. He was brought in as the 2K15 pre-order bonus ended up putting pen to paper. I gotta mention though that he did make a documentary appearance a couple of months earlier, but you get it. What I'm trying to say is that 2K Sports manages to make that connection between Legend and WWE. In May of 2016, a trailer for WWE 2K17 was released. It depicted Goldberg staring down Suplex City, which was a nice damn touch, and I barely, barely, barely noticed it. Following this, Goldberg began appearing in promotional events and why not? Same thing from Lesnar. For some reason, they started talking about each other, they were trading insults on Twitter, some interviews too. Both men showed interest in a rematch. Bill, he wasn't that interested in the match, you know, he didn't feel he owed Brock a second chance, but he was teasing it. On the October 10, 2016 episode of Raw, and damn was that intro awesome, Paul Heyman addressed the former WCW champion statements over the past couple of weeks and months. He of course bragged about his client being on the cover of 2K17 and showed a preview of the game. He talked about how the fans wanted to experience Goldberg once again, and how his career runs parallel to Brock Lesnar's. Well, this irritated Heyman. Not because of the similar career trajectories, but because he has a victory over one Brock Lesnar. And because of that, Paul Heyman challenged him to a fight. One on one. Beast versus The Myth. Icon versus Icon, any place, anywhere, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. This initiated a Goldberg chant. Heyman was clearly trying to use this as leverage and took a jab at him, stating that he could stay where he is and live in the fantasy of 2K17, or he could step into the swing role. He'll be beaten, victimized, and in Suplex City, he's not Goldberg, he's next. Man. He was really desperate to get the match to happen. He threw in a couple of signs of praise, of course, some insults, and it was a good promo. Soon enough, Goldberg's return was confirmed for next. Week. Paul Heyman, meanwhile, was continuing his barbaric insults towards him, saying stuff like you weren't worth a sweat off Brock's tuck is, you're not good enough, yada yada, and if you do say yes, you'll be pissing Brock off. But yes, uh, the match, it looked like it was gonna happen. At the end of the night, he finally made his return. Now, one thing to know is the fact that Goldberg wasn't exactly on the best of terms with WWE previously. He didn't say much good about them, but the 2K deal really helped connect them, like I said. Yes, first time in 12 years he was back. His family was in attendance, and in my eyes it was like a superhero's homecoming or something like that. The crowd of course chanted his name, and they were pretty, pretty, pretty excited to see him. He thanked them for the humble return, mentioned the phone call from 2K, and he believed that there weren't that many superheroes in the world for kids. While promoting the game, Goldberg said that he met and shook a bunch of kids' hands, he saw joy in their eyes, and it gave him an opportunity to be that hero again. But while he was promoting the game, he created some drama. He said that it made him consider keeping in the video game, you know, Brock vs. Goldberg. But then, Lesnar challenged him to a fight. Except that wasn't even the case because he didn't have the balls to do so in the first place. It was actually Heyman who made the challenge. And this is when he believed that he had one more ass kicking left in him. He believed that there was one badass spear left, hell, maybe another jackhammer. And with his return, it meant that Brock Lesnar ain't next, he's last. A very electric return, the fans were very happy to see him. I thought it was cool that there was going to be another match at the time. It was a way of brightening the wrong of 12 years earlier. I do know for a fact that people were scared that it was going to be another snooze fest, you know? Since he accepted their challenge, Brock Lesnar made his way to Minneapolis the following week. Of course, he didn't do the talking, you know, Heyman did. And he didn't know what to refer to Goldberg as, so he called him a couple of things such as superhero, Brock Lesnar before Brock Lesnar, a bunch of stuff. He warned the Goldberg fans not to chance his name because it's pissing his client off. And they jumped teams quicker than a Patriots fan last year. And they chanted Suplex City. 
then again it was Brock's hometown so there's that. Mixed reaction from the crowd though and this left Heyman stunned. He complained about those that chanted Bill's name and he held them responsible for what happens at Survivor Series. That was it for the promo. Now the next week Goldberg was randomly bleeding. I don't know why he probably bumped his head into a wall or a door or whatever. And it wasn't proud of Heyman's remarks once again but before he could speak Paul interrupts. His client apparently wasn't too fond of the fans chanting Bill's name. Paul was damn near pissing himself as he entered the ring. This was because his client demanded he do so. He claimed that there was backup warning Goldberg not to do anything stupid, and apparently his client was an impatient beast, so he wanted to confront him face to face right here, right now. Fans, they were just salivating at this. They were ready but he didn't come out. Paulie got a little too comfortable trying to prophesize the future, you know, you'll be beat and victimized. But when he got too close to Bill, he shouted, I'm just an advocate, like he's all scared. Then Rusev of all people came out, and if you watch wrestling, you know who got the ass beat, right? Then to top it all off, Goldberg speared Heyman. He ain't scared of no Brock Lesnar, I mean, he beat him in the past. Two weeks later was their first confrontation in about 12 years. It was the go-home show for Survivor Series, we knew that some wild stuff was going down. Paul Heyman once again tried speaking, so Bill quickly silenced him. He showed so much intensity in that moment. He was about to pop out of my screen or something and beat my ass too. Fans were basically enabling him by chanting his name, and Paul tried to get back on track and tried making it seem like the security weren't here for Brock. They were here for Bill. He got annoyed with a little spiel and told Brock that he's beating a lot of people, but his name is not on that damn list. And then told him to shove that list where the sun don't shine. Paul was continuously mentioning Goldberg's family that he threatened to rip his head off and feed it to Lesnar. He apologized but questioned this little superhero thing calling it a myth. The chance were really getting to Lesnar at this point and Heyman wanted to make one last offer to Goldberg. Back out and we'll find a suitable replacement. This was enough to awaken Goldberg. He heard far too much and Paul was warning him not to get too agitated. He told him that Sunday you'll be beaten, victimized, and conquered by Brock Lesnar and so it began. Goldberg heard enough after Paul claimed that his son will be calling Brock daddy? Security were cleared out and it was time? Nah, he wasn't. Brock preferred to fight another day. And so yeah, that's the build of the match. It was basically Paul Heyman and Brock goading Goldberg into this match. The billing was that fantasy warfare just got real. Now I remember watching this back in 2016. I watched it the next day not knowing what went down. And suddenly at this point in time, I realized there was like 7 minutes left. So I wondered what was going to go down. I will say though that I didn't expect it to happen like it did though. So the bell rings. Both men stare a hole in each other's eyes. Lesnar tries establishing dominance, but he was quickly schooled. Then Goldberg catches him off guard with a damn spear. The fans went crazy and there's another one. Heyman was starting to shout, Brock, watch out, whatever. Crowd's chanting Goldberg's name and he hits the jackhammer. One, two, three. Damn, that was a huge moment. Can't undersell it. Like, when I watched it, I was in shock. I couldn't believe it. Because up to this point in time, Brock had yet to be properly pinned. What I mean by that is after ending the streak, Lesnar was essentially unstoppable. But to see him lose in such fashion, I, I don't even know what to say. But yes, that Survivor Series in general was just off the charts. The elimination match, you saw Shane McMahon get legit killed in the middle of the ring. The Shield formed a little reunion despite not being on the same team. Toronto crowd was exciting. Oh man, it was a fun one. And this one, it's definitely one of the more memorable moments of the decade, for sure. I mean, the WWE weren't exactly doing these sudden finishes back in 2016. With Goldberg's return, they started doing these more often in Lesnar and Goldberg's matches, so yeah. Anytime Lesnar competed before November of 2016, the match was over 10 minutes. Following this, it was never the same again. The next night on Raw, saw Goldberg announced that he is entering the Rumble. He was thankful for the opportunity, you know, he's back and whatever. And then he got to the topic of one more title run. Fans were more than happy to hear that, and he announced it, that's all. As for Brock Lesnar, he disappeared like he always does. Heyman was doing the talking once again. He announced that his client is in the Rumble. He didn't make an appearance until the January 16th episode of Raw, and on that night, he caused anarchy and chaos like he always does. He threw Roman and Sami Zayn around. They teased a fight between himself and Strowman, but that wasn't to be. He ended up taking a Superman punch from Roman, but quickly got back on track with an F5. He wanted to assert his dominance before the event, and yeah, it was a success. Goldberg and Lesnar did meet up once again the following week on the Go Home Show. They warned everybody in the Rumble staying that they're next when Heyman interrupted. He was given a list of possible confrontations from the Rumble, and of course, Heyman mentioned his client. Then he announced that he was actually in the building, and out he came. Paul billed him as the instrument of Goldberg's demise and promised that he will be conquered. Bill had enough and called Brock a dumbass and so it was time for another confrontation, but then the lights went out and it was The Undertaker. The three men stared into each other's eyes as Raw went off the air. But anyways, at the Rumble, Brock Lesnar entered at number 26. He had a point to prove, of course, so he did what he does best, 
give it to our suplex city unfortunately dean rusev jericho corbin miz orton they're all victims as everybody's down on the match, freaking Enzo enters, gets clotheslined inside out. It was a sight to see. Then number 28 came out, and it was Goldberg. The ghost of Lesnar's past. Once again, Brock gets ahead of himself and walks into yet another spear before getting clotheslined out. Michael Cole was going crazy. The crowd, by the sounds of it, loved it. And again, Brock, he underestimated Goldberg and got what's coming to him. That's the story they're telling. It's obvious. This got him even more angry, as evident by the next night when Paul Heyman once again laid down the challenge. It was a huge blemish to Brock's legacy in Heyman's eyes, you know, the loss to Goldberg, and he compared it to Andre the Giant who was undefeated for 15 years but got body slammed at WrestleMania 3. The two words that encompassed this promo were yeah but. It was bugging him. He didn't want to live with that. Goldberg beating him in a minute and 26 seconds was clearly eating him up inside. He may have never spoken about it, but just the emotion pouring out from Heyman says it all. It came to the point where every time he mentions Brock Lesnar, somebody's like, yeah, but Goldberg. He hated this, he absolutely despised this, and he wanted it to be eradicated. He wanted this to end, and so in order for that to happen, he challenged Goldberg for one final match at WrestleMania. Heyman knew that the odds were in Goldberg's favor, but wanted to make the challenge anyways. Meanwhile, he was actually going to challenge for the Universal title, and he ended up accepting, by the way. So the rematch rematch was on for WrestleMania 33 in April. FS Lane Bill ended up capturing the title. Some liked the decision, some didn't. I'll get into it later, though. So, of course, he had to come out to discuss his title victory the next night at Raw. He got a mixed reaction from the crowd, even though he said that it couldn't be done without them. This was back when the crowd used to chant CM Punk every two minutes, you know? Remember that? But anyways, Paul Heyman had the nerve to interrupt, and he said that his hand shouldn't be the one that shakes Bills. It should be someone else. And that someone else was actually here... And out he came, Brock Lesnar once again. They went face to face, and Lesnar was actually in a happy mood. He was happy to see Goldberg become champion, and he saw as Goldberg proven himself to be as much of a beast as himself, as much of a conqueror as himself. On April 2nd, there'll be a new champion in Heyman's eyes. So he offered his hand to congratulate the new champ, but this was the moment where Heyman proceeded to call him Brock's new. This caught the champ off guard, so Brock hit the F5 on him, and it was the first time in a long time that Brock actually got one over Bill Goldberg. Heading into WrestleMania, Paul Heyman did a usual spiel regarding Brock. You know, Goldberg will be victimized, the reigning, the new champion, whatever. You know what he's talking about. But before the event, they had one final meeting. Heyman had a somewhat warm welcome from some seeing as Raw was in Philadelphia, and he proclaimed Brock to be the extremist who shall derail Goldberg's ultimate thrill ride. Once again, the fans proceeded to chant his name. They quickly hopped Team Zone, this seemed to get a reaction out of Brock Lesnar. Paul did have words of praise for Bill calling him a superhero, and even proclaiming him the man. But he warned him, stating that Lesnar's no ordinary man, he's a beast, and simply put, Goldberg's going to Suplex City, the place where people check in, but don't check out. He even thought it was fitting to call WrestleMania to title it, WrestleMania 33, Death of the Superhero. Then he heard enough and he came out. The Universal Champion knew damn well that people didn't come here to see them talking. They wanted to see them fight. So he decided to bring a little WrestleMania to Philly. And down the ramp he ran. He quickly speared Lesnar and he showed that he still had his number. That was it. Now their match at WrestleMania on my eyes was perfectly booked. They righted the wrong of 2004. Both guys had fully stored finishers. There was some exciting offense. Brock was on don't F up mode. He had to win this, like, his legacy and his eyes had depended on this match. That's what I could take away from the build. The title was just an additional token. Quickly in the beginning, Brock took him to Suplex City, but BOOM! He gets a spear, and I'm just wondering, like, what the hell is going on? I literally watched this right now for the first time in four years, and I was going crazy. I mean, I already know who won, but it was just so insane to watch it again. He goes for another spear, and then a spear through the barricade. It was exciting stuff. In the ring, Goldberg attempts a jackhammer. Nope. He hits another spear. He finally has to jackhammer, but for the first time, it wasn't enough for the W. He's like, that's all I got. Next spear wasn't to be. Freaking Lesnar leaped over him, and it was back to Suplex City. He hit several consecutive Germans. I believe 10 Germans in total. And the crowd, fun, 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 fun. Brock then hits the F5-1. Two, three, loud. They redeemed themselves and them some. It was just a five-minute match, yet it was the highlight of the, the highlight of the day. Like when I think about WrestleMania 33 and the positives, this is always one of the first things I think of. Definitely. Like what the hell? So insane to watch again. Lesnar and Goldberg, they just went out there and basically played a freaking WWE game in real life. It was fun. Brock finally exercises Demon, and they told a story there that I really liked. Even the best of them can find themselves in a slump. Brock took Goldberg for granted, thinking he's like everyone else, and once he got the chance to face him in a one-on-one -on -one match, he realized this dad was different. Even though he bleeds at random moments, has two moves, he was the real beast. 
So Brock had to dig down deep and it kind of reminds me of Rocky 3. Overall, uh, entertaining feud, I will say that. I do think they didn't need the title. I mean, this feud didn't necessitate championship gold. There was a story there with Brock, you know, he could just exercise his demon, that's all, without the title. And it kind of screwed over Jericho and Owens. Like, their match, I remember that match being so underwhelming. I remember when Owens went for the cover to win the title, I was like, that's it? I thought there was gonna be more from that match, but it just didn't happen. Like, this feud basically harmed the other feud, so that's what I'm trying to say. Yes, they didn't need the title, you know, it was just a story that they could have easily told without championship gold. It was there. You know, Brock, he's beginning to doubt himself and whatever. That's all they needed to do. They didn't need a championship, right? It is what it is, but one thing to mention is that this match was actually way better than that of Owens and Jericho's in my eyes, so yeah. I mean, overall, entertaining feud. I had fun watching it back then, and I had fun watching it again right now, so yeah. And that's the first video. Make sure you hit an F5 on the like button, perhaps a jackhammer on the subscribe button. Peace. I'm out.